Okay, welcome everybody to the to the the first um, East West Psychology Metamorphosis uh, lecture in uh, in this academic year. Very excited to be here with you all, and very uh, uh, excited to have Robert and Debashish uh, start us off this year. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to my co-host Stefan Julich um, to introduce our speakers for tonight. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks so much. One. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. I almost said combatants. <laughs> our two speakers for the evening, uh, Debashish Banerjee and Robert McDermott. Uh, Debashish Banerjee is the Haridas Chaudhary Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures and Doshi Professor of Asian Art at CIIS. He's also chair of the East-West Psychology department and the Asian Contemplative and Transcultural Studies Department, which is a brand new concentration uh, that we've formed just this year. He has authored and edited several books on the culture and philosophy of India and on critical posthumanism. And he's curated a number of exhibitions of Asian art um, and is a co-founder of the Indian Posthumanist Network. Robert McDermott, who officially retired from CIIS at the end of last year, is Emeritus Professor and Emeritus President from CIIS and Emeritus Professor from Bernard and Baruch College in New York. He is editor of The Essential Aurobindo, The New Essential Steiner, and author of Steiner and Kindred Spirits. With Debashish Banerjee, he is editor of Philosophia, Wisdom Goddess Traditions. He was the recipient of Fulbright and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships and for 14 years, he was chair of the board of the Sophia Project for Mothers and Children at Risk of Homelessness. Gentlemen, it's yours. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Stefan. And it's a pleasure to be conversing with Robert McDermott uh, once again. We've had many conversations and our conversations continue. They're public and private, uh, seamless uh, ocean of conversations. So uh, pleasure to be talking to you, Robert. Uh, and today we are going to talk about Sri Aurobindo and modern thought. Um, this is the name of a book that we are co-writing and we've also taught a course by this name. And the idea of this conversation and this topic is to think about Sri Aurobindo who um, has a very central place uh, at the California Institute of Integral Studies because the founder of this institution was directly connected with Sri Aurobindo, a follower, a disciple, and also uh, the Integral in California Institute of Integral Studies, uh, though not his creation uh, put in after his, his passing is really related to the Integral in Sri Aurobindo uh, due to his connection. So the question that we are asking uh, each other and uh, ourselves is what, brings Sri Aurobindo into our times. Sri Aurobindo as a person, a thinker, uh, contextualized by our age, the modern age. Uh, I'd also say that today we think in terms of a postmodern age, but the postmodern is not really a complete break from the modern. It is a, in a way a break and in a way a continuation. So to understand postmodernity, we must also understand modernity. So Sri Aurobindo, I'd say, straddles these time periods, these epochs. Uh, and so we are going to talk about that a little bit. So one thing to contextualize our conversation is to point to the fact that Sri Aurobindo's mental makeup, his um, real, maturity as a thinker occurred in England. And in his uh, studies at Cambridge University, uh, where he was uh, at the end of his stay in England, 
um, where very fertile ideas were being discussed at the time that he was there, which is the end of the 19th century. And uh, I'd like to contextualize our period, the modern period, by four very seminal streams of thought and four very seminal figures that uh, established themselves in the 19th century. Um, and Sri Aurobindo, one may say, engaged with all of them uh, in his own way, though he went forward and nuanced a lot of their teachings as well. Um, one of them is uh, Marx, Marx from the viewpoint of social thought, um, the notion of a world which is classless, uh, which is without hierarchy. So social and political thinking is a very important aspect of modern thought. Uh, another is Darwin, the idea of evolution, which made its entry into the 19th century and had a very strong impact on the idea of, of time, of the experience of time, and just generally of uh, the notion of uh, what it means to be human. Uh, the third thinker I'd like to point to is Freud uh, and the founding of modern psychology. And the fourth thinker I'd like to point to is Nietzsche, who stands again at that same cusp between the 19th and the 20th century. And I'd say represents the break from enlightenment philosophy to today what we call postmodern philosophy. So he's modernist in, the, in that sense. And we find that Sri Aurobindo engages with all these four streams of thought, social and political thought, uh, the thought of evolution, uh, ideas of psychology, and the ideas of modern philosophy. Um, we find that his engagement with social thought particularly uh, begins towards the end of his stay. And when Sri Aurobindo went to England, he didn't really have uh, that much of a idea about, about the oppressions of colonialism. Uh, but his father was what's called an Anglophile. In other words, somebody who was enamored of the British and kept him away from Indians. But towards the end of his stay, he started sending him newspaper clippings about some of the atrocities of the British. And that was the beginning of his anti-colonial thinking. Uh, and he came back in 1893, a very important year for a number of reasons, as we'll see, and launched into a freedom struggle. And that was the beginning of his social and political life. And I'll turn it over to Robert at this point to discuss this aspect of Sri Aurobindo's life as it pertains to this current of thought. Good. Thank you. Well, like Devashish, I'm very pleased to be in not, not only this conversation, but any number of conversations that we have both privately and publicly. And we're happy to share this one with you because we share a deep commitment to uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Um, in fact, I credit Devashish with sort of uh, luring me back into a strong Sri Aurobindo connection. Not that he did it by himself. I think we, he had some help from another level. Uh, in any case, uh, we have a, uh, a, also a, a, what, a career commitment in that we are will be publishing that book and doing these dialogues and all kinds of other commitments. And, and I'm happy to say uh, that we went to uh, Pondicherry, to the ashram, and to Oroville together. And I had a, uh, an enlivening of my relationship to Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And I, I'm very grateful to Debushish uh, for that time that we had together. So 1893 is a wonderful year to contemplate because this 21-year-old 
uh, a recent uh, college, uh, in a way, uh, college graduate, we can say, but also he didn't, uh, he was to have passed the civil service exam, and then he would have worked for the civil service in India, which is one of the ways that the British uh, both trained their people to help uh, oversee the country um, and also to keep tabs on things and uh, uh, spread English language, etc. And Sri Aurobindo, who wasn't then Sri, but Aurobindo Ghosh, um, refused to show up for the writing exam, uh, horse writing. <laughs> uh, and uh, as a result, he was not certified, which I think in retros retrospect we can see was obviously a karmic decision of some some significance. Instead of coming under the control of the British, he was free to become a revolutionary, actually. That's not too strong a word. At the same time, in uh, 1893, uh, a scrawny a, uh, young Indian in Gujarat uh, met with his uh, uh, un uncles, uh, and uh, they decided that he should accept an invitation from South Africa to work with the, the Muslim businessmen, and they were all men in South Africa. Uh, and so, uh, and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi left in 1893, and uh, you could think that he was there for a short time, especially if you saw the Attenborough film, which is quite amazing, really, and wonderfully faithful, except in this one respect, that it could give the give you the idea that he was only there a short time, but actually he was there uh, for about 20 years. Um, uh, so it's, they managed, and I think this has a quite a fascinating karmic um, personality of its own, that uh, this uh, uh, Bengali educated in England arrives to become the leader of India and the Gujarati, uh, uh, Indian leaves to go to South Africa and doesn't come back until Sri Aurobindo has gone to Pondicherry and Gandhi then emerges as the foremost leader of the uh, Indian independence movement. The other part of the fascinating missing of these two biographies is that they also miss each other's, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, yoga uh, practice and, and understanding. Um, so Gandhi is 100% a karma yogi. He's focused entirely on action, uh, on morality, politics, problem solving, negotiations, um, and uh, spinning wheel, and community organization, and walking from village to village in the uh, 95 degree heat uh, in this tiny little uh, loincloth and his glasses falling down and his and his stick and in the meantime the uh, fabulously elegant British educated uh, Aurobindo Ghosh is in Pondicherry in French India writing philosophy and poetry and they just couldn't be further apart in every possible way and we of course inherit them both uh, and if you have a uh, a good spiritual sense for integral yoga, which uh, our, uh, which um, Debashish will talk about a little bit. Um, you know that his idea of yoga included karma yoga, but it also included nana yoga, knowledge yoga, and also bhakti, devotional yoga. And then he included within that the yogas in terms of the uh, evolution of the consciousness. And um, David Sheesh will do more about that. Okay, so uh, I guess I want you to be aware of these two great figures. David Sheesh wrote a, David Sheesh and I wrote an afterward to a book on Gandhi and Sri Aurobindo. And it's a tremendously interesting topic, which I recommend to you, partly so that you can figure out what what is your yoga relationship? Are you really integral, thinking, feeling, willing, evolution of consciousness, and tantra, the relationship to the physical and the material? Or are you focused with Gandhi on karma as the great task of the time, 
to solve our social, moral, political problems in which Sri Aurobindo was interested, but not in an activist way. So sometimes here in CIIS, uh, uh, an applicant will ask, well, you know, are you activist? And I think the answer is actually, we don't spend a lot of time on the picket line. We're trying to change consciousness by developing our own consciousness. And I think maybe that's all I'll say about that, Debishish. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Robert, for bringing together these two really important figures, um, different styles, but with the same intent, uh, which is the intent of uh, um, being free of national freedom. And I think that's where the whole idea of the sort of large complex stream of social and political thought comes in. Um, one of the things that people should know about the prolific writing of Sri Aurobindo that you mentioned, Robert, is that he wrote a book on his social and political philosophy. Um, you know, actually two books, The Human Cycle and The Ideal of Human Unity. And to, again, think about, you know, I talked about Marx, I think where Marx comes into all this, neither of them were, I mean, explicit Marxists. But where Marx comes into all this is where I think he spawns the idea of a society that is non-hierarchical, that is not uh, driven by various forms of oppression. And I think Marx himself was not that much of an anti-colonial person. Uh, he actually... Uh, thought it was a good idea for uh, colonialism to happen because uh, I think his historical materialism uh, went in the direction of that all the world has to first become industrialized and only then can the proletariat rise. So, uh, you know, colonialism was to him a means towards a international end. Uh, but of course, that's not how these people saw it. Uh, they saw it, Gandhi saw India as largely an agrarian country. Um, and Sri Aurobindo saw India largely as a spiritual country. And from their viewpoint, I think the notion of social and political thought had the same goal of a, 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 a society, a classless society, a society without um, hierarchic, uh, you know, determinations. But at the same time, I, I think for Sri Aurobindo, it went one step further. And that's what we'll discuss later when we talk about the mother and Auroville, which is an experiment in the social philosophy of Sri Aurobindo, which I think he, we, he called it spiritual anarchism. And the whole idea of the fact that government is ultimately uh, 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 today a necessary evil, but in the long run, an unnecessary evil. And instead of that, the power of consciousness to create unity. So I, I think that's a very uh, important contribution of Sri Aurobindo with re related to the context of modern thought. Um, I think the other really important area is that of evolution, Robert. What do you say? That yes, absolutely. The idea of evolution. Yes. So uh, I think we're going to leave uh, Marx and Gandhi um, behind for a few minutes and look at, let's call it the big picture, the uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo's context, uh, which he shares with um, Teilhard and, and, and Steiner and some other huge thinkers. Interestingly, all the thinkers on the evolution of consciousness are male. Uh, it, it seems like a, a, a particular attraction. Um, and, and it's interesting for you all to think about how, how large a framework can you handle or should we be trying to, to affirm when we are looking at problems? Sri Aurobindo is, uh, is saying that uh, you, in order to understand a problem and to come up with an adequate solution, you have to know where you are in the evolution. You have to know whether you are at the time of 
uh, of the just beginning of humanity or what kind of uh, intelligence is possible. And so Sri Aurobindo uh, has an idea of evolutional consciousness, which focuses on the need to uh, work our way out of, not to ignore, but to work our way out of, let's call it modernism and an intellect, rationality of the, let's say, take the 18th century as perfectly representative, and then to go from there to a, uh, a, uh, an intuitive and a, and a spiritual thinking, which enables you to see where you are in history. What, what is the task of the time? And so Sri Aurobindo said, the task of the time is consciousness. So he didn't need to go village to village. He needed to go to Pondicherry and write book after book about consciousness. Consciousness, as David she said, with a social and political content, but also the poetic and, and the interpretation of the, of the text and to, uh, and to use the text in such a way to make them relevant without losing any of the spirituality. In fact, adding the spirituality because it's contemporary. Now, um, Teilhard had a somewhat similar uh, idea, but again, uh, even though he lived 20 years in China and he, li he also lived in Egypt and, in, and he was uh, at many other uh, parts of the world where he worked, um, his, his orientation is absolutely Western and Christian. The same is true of Steiner, it's Western and Christian. And so when we're talking about Sri Aurobindo, we are talking about someone who, though educated in England with a deep draft of Hegel and evolution of thinking, all right, and the spirit manifesting in history and in society, he very quickly became a thoroughgoing Indian. In fact, he kind of made up for lost time. He really became a thoroughly committed uh, Indian uh, and learned Sanskrit and translated Sanskrit. And of course, he already had Bengali, though he had to recover it since he left Bengal when he was six, actually, when he was five. Um, and, and first he went to the Himalayas to be educated by Irish nuns, the picture I especially enjoy. And then he went to Manchester. Okay, so we're talking about a, a, a visionary with a uh, from 1893 to 1910, so uh, uh, 17 years of radical political activity. So he was hunted by the British and considered the uh, number one enemy of the British Raj, that is to say, the British control of India. And so when he then begins to uh, meditate and practice his spiritual exercises, he is already a, has a significant past as a revolutionary. So it, it, it really, that's an amazing fusion, I think, of a revolutionary become, uh, become mystic, become poet, um, and then uh, the person who really sees in a, an amazing way uh, the task of India in the, in the modern world, namely to hold up the, the vision and the reality of spiritual life. So maybe that's enough on that part of evolution of consciousness, but Debushish, would you want to say something yeah. about Darwin and Bergson? Yeah, absolutely, Robert. And I think you touched on, you brought Teilhard and you also brought, brought Hegel into the picture. And I think uh, that aspect, uh, you know, of Sri Aurobindo's thought uh, is more metaphysical. It's about that, you know, when we, when we relate it to Darwin, which is really a natural process, a process of natural selection, uh, there are two ways in which Sri Aurobindo, one may say, brings in the aspect of consciousness. Uh, one is that there is an evolution of consciousness. And th that is what, there's a metaphysical principle to evolution in Hegel, uh, but Sri Aurobindo similarly, there's a metaphysics of evolution uh, that takes us beyond the, the human, beyond the rational. And uh, there's also, like in Teilhard, a vision of a, as you said, we have to know where we are in history, that we are at an impending point of a 
a, a leap into a, another consciousness. And then on the other hand, you have uh, conscious evolution. So these two things, the evolution of consciousness and conscious evolution, both are in a way related to Darwin, but deviating from him, taking off from him. Um, conscious evolution, uh, you know, the name of that famous book by Berks on creative evolution um, is really about conscious evolution. And Berkson as a philosopher, um, you know, is very closely, intimately in relation with the scientists of his time, including uh, Darwin. And he is uh, challenging Darwin on that very topic that it's not just by natural evolution that a natural selection that evolution happens, but there is a factor of consciousness. And that factor of consciousness as he analyzes it has to do with memory, with the fact that the intellect actually goes back to go forward, that we are untimely, that the other thinker that I pointed to Nietzsche is also very much in that vein because he talks about the Superman, that the evolution of consciousness beyond the human, where one goes back to go forward, to leap forward, and becomes untimely to overcome our own historical moment. So, and I think Sri Aurobindo in a very similar way is talking about how we can call down powers that are not yet here. How can we evolve to a condition beyond what is accepted? So I think in those ways, he's, he's a significantly uh, a thinker of modernity that is trying to exceed the boundaries of evolutionary thought. Uh, the other aspect that Sri Aurobindo represents uh, in terms of, we were talking about psychology and uh, the place of Freud, but Freud uh, is entering into the picture where we are looking at a secular world, a world which is no longer determined by the notion of who humans are given down by some kind of religion. So it's a psychological process. And we find Sri Aurobindo uh, declaring that yoga is nothing but practical psychology. So this, this entry into the domain of the religious or the spiritual as a psychology is something that we find with Sri Aurobindo. And we start seeing that world religion is also developing at this point, uh, the notion of different religious denominations and here, again, the 1893 date becomes very important because there's the Parliament of World Religions in, uh, in, in Chicago in 1893. And Vivekananda, another of the great figures of this period, makes his uh, debut uh, as a religious thinker in or spiritual thinker in that parliament. But there are other thought currents at that time that relate to world religion, a religion that is universal or that is perennial or things of that kind, a, a kind of a overcoming of the sectarian boundaries of religion. And theosophy is one of them. And I think Robert, would you like to uh, discuss that a little bit? Uh, the place of uh, Madame Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, in the creation of a world religion in our times. Yes, great. You know, Devishish, I had not ever put together the 1893, which I love because it's Aurobindo coming and Gandhi leaving and how that's so symbolic of their missing each other in every way. But I hadn't put together the Parliament of Religion, even though Paul is an important part of my biography. I once spoke at the 100th anniversary at the same time that the Dalai Lama was meeting with people making the human rights chat, right? <laughs> and I said to the audience, what are you doing here? You should be hearing the Dalai Lama. And they said, we couldn't get in. <laughs> so I was happy to take second prize. Uh, but anyway, it's a great year to think about Vivekananda talking to all these white men, you know, so intent on which version of Protestantism is, is slightly better than the other one. In the meantime, 
in comes Vivekananda and gives them a world, uh, truly another world that they would just found completely astonishing. It's wonderful. Uh, and then don't forget William James is, uh, you know, over in, uh, in Cambridge, not so far away, and working on uh, uh, consciousness, evolution of consciousness, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and again, a person who is interested in spirit and not in religious, not in religion. And so his book is called Varieties of Religious Experience. And the people he's talking about are religious, but his uh, methodology and his, uh, his uh, commitment is not to religion as such. Uh, he actually wasn't a religious practitioner, but he was rather, as we have often say, uh, spiritual, not religious. And that's true of theosophy, which drew heavily from Hinduism and Buddhism and, and uh, very self-consciously not from Christianity. They were actually somewhat, somewhat anti-Christian, uh, especially Annie Besant, who comes after Madame Blavatsky. But I'd like you to consider Madame Blavatsky, this absolutely fabulous figure, complicated, uh, you know, she left her husband, who was a middle-aged um, uh, military man, when she herself was only, I think, about 18 or 19. She traveled to Tibet. She traveled to the Middle East. She came to the United States. I mean, she's just, she's irrepressible. She's She leaks into everything. She brought, she brings down the whole evolution of consciousness in two volumes with amazing detail. Uh, and some of it, you know, is uh, hard to organize, but she's just totally thrilling. And then a whole movement comes, especially when she moves to Adya uh, near Madras. And uh, there, um, you know, the, the theosophical movement spreads throughout the world, especially in, actually it doesn't thrive in New York, it thrives uh, in Los Angeles and England and, you know, it involves people, so many people like Yates and uh, et cetera. We don't have time to do all that. But another movement that is, again, um, in itself not religious, though that's a weird thing to say about it, and that's Steiner and Anthroposophy. He is obviously very Christian. Anthroposophy is very Christian. But he was trying, trying hard to convince the people hearing him, mostly ex-Christians or maybe somewhat Christian, but trying to be spiritual, not religious, that it's possible to be spiritual and not be in a religion. And then when he was asked by uh, Lutherans mostly, could he help them? He did help them. And then he sort of crossed the line, not, not in terms of his teaching, but in terms of what a person could do. And I think his sentence is very important. He says, those people who come into the world uh, in such a way at, uh, in su such a way that religion a religion, say Christianity, uh, would be helpful to their spiritual development that they should avail themselves of that opportunity. But his point was that not everybody should think that this is necessary. It is possible to have a completely spiritual life uh, with, uh, with your own spiritual discipline, without a guru, without sacraments, uh, and without... Uh, uh, a religious institution. It's all very, very complicated. I've given you an extremely um, sort of abbreviated introduction, but Blavatsky and Steiner are very similar in this regard in terms of what they were trying to do. And Steiner was the head of the German section of the Theosophical Society from 1902 until 1912. So that's uh, 10 years that he was the teacher of German, uh, German theosophy. Uh, and then he broke for various reasons we won't discuss tonight. And then there are two movements, Theosophy and Anthroposophy. I'm just now reading an enormous book called Reincarnation, the Phoenix Fire Mystery or something or other. And it's by Theosophists. And the last section is all about Theosophy. And there's only one mention of Steiner, totally insignificant. Um, and that's typical how the Theosophists don't mention Steiner, the Anthroposophists don't mention theosophy. In the meantime, they are extremely similar, they're continuous, and they're both options within 
what uh, we are talking about tonight to some extent, namely the uh, the post postmodern uh, spirituality and sp uh, spiritual historical vision and spiritual practice. Okay, so um, why don't you follow that, Devashish, with Ramakrishna and Vivekananda? Yes, so Robert, and I, I also want to mention to catch, uh, you know, the, the last part of what you're saying uh, with the fact that uh, we also would like to discuss uh, the place of the mother in all this. And that's related to what you're saying, because here is this movement that's going on in Europe uh, at this time of really all these um, synthesis of world spiritual traditions uh, and what we today call the Western esoteric tradition, which is really a modern thing. Uh, the creation of uh, a, a, a synthetic Western spirituality. And that I think is something which the mother was also a participant of in France with the Cosmic Review and people who were part of that in a, in a relationship, one would say, uh, even if it may not be a direct historical relationship, a thought relationship. And in the same way in India, uh, around that time, in the turn of the century, we have a number of these kind of thinkers who are synthesizing spiritual traditions, Indian traditions and the traditions that have colonized India. So the most, one may say, uh, uh, important figure for Sri Aurobindo, uh, who is a precursor in this way, is Ramakrishna. And then his disciple Vivekananda, who we already mentioned. Um, and we find that Ramakrishna really synthesizes uh, all the various traditions of his time, uh, one after the other, and achieves their spiritual goals. And the then Vivekananda coming along and also trying to talk about a universal, he used the term universal religion. And the thing is that just as you mentioned, Robert, with uh, William James uh, talking about varieties of religious experience, uh, what Vivekananda meant by universal religion is very close to what William James, in fact, William James talks about Ramakrishna in, yes, in varieties of spiritual of religious uh, experience so i think that there's a much more fluid line between religion and spirituality at that at that phase that hardens later once uh, we confront the most sectarian boundaries and the excesses of religion um, you know so that it's interesting to note that i mean there was a whole case uh, in India, uh, which revolved actually two cases, one related to Sri Aurobindo and one related to Ramakrishna, uh, revolving around whether the teaching of Ramakrishna was a religion or not. And the same for the entire problem that arose with relation to Auroville uh, and the government of India, which ultimately got resolved through the, you know, the court deciding that Auroville was not a religious place, you see. So this kind of a, uh, you know, the, the world spirituality versus world religion and, you know, coming together of all these traditions, idea of perennialism is all being born at this time. But I think there's a very, again, talking about the postmodern, uh, and Jonathan was mentioning bringing Medhananda into this uh, um this forum, this uh, uh, metamorphosis uh, talks later, who's written about Ramakrishna, uh, the new way of looking at these people is exactly where we are challenging the notion of the perennial. So the perennial, which was a really important idea, Aldous Huxley wrote his book, Perennial Philosophy. It all emerges out of this milu Vivekananda with his universal religion is actually straddling these two boundaries, the, the perennial and the plural. So we find that now uh, this use of the word Vigyana by Ramakrishna and also Sri Aurobindo 
who translated this word in English as supermind um, is now being held up as a ideal that is postmodern in the sense that it is not perennial, it's post perennial in the sense that, you know, as, as the title of Midananda's book points out, infinite paths to infinite reality. That is, all the various ways by which the divine can come to us are infinite and we can have infinite ways to it. It's the same divine, but we should not forget that it's the infinite divine. And the meeting point of the unique and the universal or the individual or the finite and the infinite is not a disappearance of the finite in favor of the infinite, but it's a coexistence of the two as one, uh, as Sri Aurobindo's interpretation of the Isha Upanishad points out. And that is a condition beyond the mind. Uh, that is what he called supermind. So these ideas, these ideas of world religion taking a trajectory and moving into a, a, a perspectival vanishing point, we may say, is again something we find with Sri Aurobindo. Uh, and then, uh, since we've already touched on it, Robert, the question of uh, the Western traditions and the mother who, in coming to Sri Aurobindo, really represents a union, again, talking about the meeting of world religions, the meeting of the East and the West. And would you like to discuss that a little bit, Robert? No, I would like to discuss it at great length. <laughs> it's so fascinating <laughs> to just think about this uh, this union, uh, to use the word you. So we have a, a woman who was uh, born in France of parents who were probably Italian, who had lived in the Middle East, uh, one with a Egyptian background, one with uh, um, Turkish, uh, what Debashish was referring to before, uh, she somehow gets to Algeria as a very young person. Debashish, I think she was probably only 20 years old when she was in studying with a great esoteric uh, occult teacher, Max Theon and his wife, Alma. Um, and then she, at a young age, married a, a painter named Morrissey, a real upscale artist. And so she went into the art world. And then she married uh, Paul Richard, a diplomat. And they went to uh, Pondicherry as part of his, his career. And guess what? Karma, karma struck big time. And he went first that he said, wow, you're the one we've been looking for. And now here's a French diplomat finding this Indian sage and saying, you're, the, you're the, the spiritual teacher we've been looking for. He wasn't looking in Christianity and he didn't look in Hinduism. He looked at a person who, was, who transcended Hinduism. And then comes this uh, woman by way of Italian, Turkish, Egyptian, French, uh, esoteric, uh, and married to this diplomat, and she then sees Sri, not Sri, Aurobindo Ghosh, and says, oh, you look just like the Krishna who has been appearing to me in my dreams. So, I mean, does anybody doubt that karma is working overtime here? And then um, the war, the First World War starts, 1914. That was, in, that was also 1914. Um, and then uh, the, her husband, Paul Richard, goes back to France, and she goes to Japan for six years. Now, did she become a, a Shinto or a Japanese Buddhist? or Ch No, she became a student of Japanese spirituality. Japanese aesthetics, I would say, was probably the primary influence. So she's getting another dimension for her huge of uh, spiritual biography. So then she goes back and when the war is over, she goes to Pondicherry again with Paul Richard and uh, again, then realizes that this is where she should be. And she was, I think, so far as I can tell, 
planning to stay with Paul Richard, but then it's a very complicated chapter that I can't do justice to, but I'll mention, um, namely that she and Sri Aurobindo recognized, as they said, that uh, the mother's uh, husband, Paul Richard, was uh, uh, captured by a, uh, an Azura of falsehood. And they confronted him with this, and maybe he even knew it. Uh, but in any case, either they couldn't free him, or he wasn't willing to be freed, or whatever. Uh, he then left the ashram and came to the United States. Uh, we had quite a few children, and that's a whole other story. And obviously, karmically, this is very convenient because the mother then recognized, as Sri Aurobindo recognized, that they should uh, be spiritual collaborators. I think of them, and I, some of you do as well, as co-avatars. That is to say, they were the male-female partners uh, serving the time, the spiritual need of the world at that time, in the, in the uh, first quarter of the 20th uh, century. Um, and then, so the mother then took over, oh, 1926, Sri Aurobindo had this deep experience of Krishna in the prison where the British put him for a year waiting trial. They like to put people in jail to keep them out of, uh, out of their way. Uh, he, while in prison, the Alipur jail, which is not pleasant, I visited it, it was quite horrible, even then, um, he had a, a, a visionary experience of, uh, of uh, uh, Swami, Swami uh, Vivekananda. But in 1926, he had something more uh, sort of tangible. I think of it as a, as a kind of, um, uh, kind of an interior experience or uh, almost like a, a, an embedded experience. Um, maybe David Sheesh could say more about it, uh, but it's quite mysterious, but it's very profound and transformative and enabled him to say that he was now working or he would be there at thereafter working on a, um, uh, a, another level of consciousness, which he called the overmind consciousness, which is the highest level until such time as the supermind consciousness uh, could be realized. Also, we're not to that chapter yet, but that's one of the, that's what we want to be aware of: is that this is absolutely sublime spiritual joining of the uh, the Bengali educated in England. Uh, living in uh, French India, joined by this woman who is uh, a, 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 an Italian, French, uh, esoteric, uh, with Japanese aesthetics coming and bringing all those elements uh, to him. It's a fabulous uh, spiritual uh, a, a, a symphony of streams and capacities. And I think maybe uh, we'll turn then to Debussy. You might want to say more about Savitri, which is Sri Aurobindo's endless poem about uh, the mother. Well, Robert, I think uh, since we are coming close to the hour, I'm thinking about all that we are discussing, Robert. And uh, I think what needs to be, uh, I mean, talking about Sri Aurobindo and modern thought and, you know, constantly seeing what are the borders or boundaries of modernity and where is it in one, in some sense, postmodern, pre-modern, coming together of all these into categories that haven't actually been, we haven't been able to talk about these categories in coherent manner as yet. Because as you as you say, I mean, even what you were saying right now, on the one hand, you have these two very modernist figures that they don't really belong to any specific religion. Uh, they are, you know, universal. Uh, they are post secular in that sense. On the other hand, they're dabbling in the gods. Uh, they're explicitly naming gods like Krishna and Kali, uh, you know, occult phenomena like the descent of the overmind are taking place. So there's an entire 
you know, sort of um, a world which is in, in, a, in, a, in a secular sense, totally non-modern. And at the same time, there is a kind of a post-secular modernity that is involved in the way in which there is a movement out of any boundaries. Um, so there is an inclusion of various names and forms. And this is happening also with uh, things like theosophy or with anthroposophy. Uh, but I think in this case, uh, we find a kind of a, a new spirituality that includes and transcends and that in a way we still haven't found the right language to deal with adequately. I think language is another very important thing for Sri Aurobindo when you were talking about Savitri, um, lang the power of language, the power of uh, the ability to articulate uh, concepts that uh, are no longer concepts that can be bound by the ideas that uh, our age has given us, new kinds of concepts. Uh, new philosophical, uh, con you know, constructs. So I, I think I'd leave it at that for that that aspect, and I bring our attention to uh, what I what we started with with regard to social and political thought, because in a way, uh, for Sri Aurobindo, what we shouldn't lose sight of, he started as a revolutionary, and he was all his life a revolutionary. I think the image of a revolutionary state of uh, society, a state a state of, one may say that, that what he calls uh, spiritual anarchism, uh, where the individual is transformed to the extent that society can be transformed. Uh, the utopian vision of Marx, Marx's utopian vision is similar that we can end up except end up in a society in which individuals experience each other as brothers or as selves. Um, that's the kingdom of Christ on earth as well. And these ideas of a perfect society and the spiritual conditions, uh, I think we should not forget that they are at the center of Sri Aurobindo's life, practice, and thought. And I think they find uh, he was trying to give some amount of uh, expression to it in the Sri Aurobindo ashram. And then the mother uh, created the experimental conditions in Auroville. Now, all these experiments are fraught with danger because they are constantly compromised by the forces that are here to distort them and swallow them up. And I believe these are the dangers that are with us today, even when we talk about um, places like Auroville. Uh, but one of the things to note about all this is that uh, I think pedagogy, the ability to create concepts, the ability to universalize ideas as a safeguard where we can internalize uh, a practice moving towards this kind of a, uh, a world, um, th there is a tremendous necessity for that. And I, I feel uh, what I'd like to turn to you, Robert, is to talk about that from the viewpoint of the influence of Sri Aurobindo on higher education through Haridas Choudhury. Because I think you know, maybe the potential of a more stable uh, manifestation of the kind of consciousness that Sri Aurobindo was seeking needs that dimension. What, what do you feel about that, Robert? Yeah, I feel <clears throat> I feel a lot of agreement about everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, as usual. Um, and uh, when I then think about the legacy. Sri Aurobindo uh, in, uh, in relation to our institution. Um, um, I remember when I went to the ashram in 1970, 
um, I met some prominent person uh, who said, oh yeah, um, there's, you know, that's a school, uh, but they're not really devoted. Now, what they meant by not really devoted was they're not sectarian, they're not exclusive. Well, Sri Aurobindo wasn't sectarian either, nor was Haridas Chaudhary. That's the great genius of both of them. They both recognize that you have to go deep into real sources, real traditions and practices, but you need to be connected and be uh, uh, involved uh, in a, on a very wide uh, canvas, a very wide network of influences and streams. And so uh, Haridas Chaudhary created a graduate school of, uh, for comparative thought. And yes, of course, uh, indebted to Sri Aurobindo and the mother, but not committed to Hinduism versus Christianity, not at all. Committed to whatever Hinduism and Christianity have to offer for uh, a person's spiritual work. Um, and so I think that they held that. So I, I want to uh, conclude my part with a one of my favorite passages, which is a little bit different from spiritual, not religious. Um, I actually wish people would say, I'm spiritual and religious, and choosing from the religion the parts that are compatible with universal spirituality and not the parts that are exclusive and combative and uh, dogmatic. Uh, and my favorite passage for this, going back to Bergson, um, is, uh, is uh, Bergson's book written 25 years after uh, Creative Evolution, a book called Two Sources of Morality and Religion. And his point was that religion is the, the sort of the ground from, from which the prophetic, the mystical, and the visionary um, spring and then are large and, and vast and inviting to people who are not dogmatic. And then that, he says, that pouring from the mystic's consciousness is hot and molten but it's too hot and too molten for non-mystics. And so we non-mystics have to wait till it cools and then we can distribute it in manageable portions. That is to say, we can go to church or synagogue or temple and we could participate in various religious rituals which are supplementary and also foundational for spiritual life. Now, this is not a single solution. Everybody has to work this out in terms of their karma, their aspirations and capacities. But what uh, Haridas was trying to do with his wonderful wife, uh, Bina, was to create a school which was not an ashram, but a school which was, in the terms that Debushish is developing, postmodern, that is to say, not, not a rational, but intuitive, spiritual, and, and deep. So it's a school that has, I tend to, the word I tend to reach for in this conversation is it's a school that is vertical. It's not just horizontal. And what the school where I taught for 20 years, uh, Baruch was, uh, was horizontal. There was no talking about transcendence or depth. So Jung couldn't get in the door because why? He talked about depth. And Freud could get in the door because he didn't talk about depth. He talks about subconscious, but it's all material. It's all intelligible. It's all modern. But Jung was trying to do uh, postmodern or trans, as in transpersonal. Uh, so uh, maybe we should just look to the ashram and Auroville as uh, foundations or as sources of this great combination of spiritual that draws from traditions without being limited by the traditions. I mean, Sri Aurobindo has a deep relationship to Indian and Hindu texts, but I wouldn't call him a Hindu. He's a, he's a if you want, neo or a post-Hindu spiritual universal 
a spiritual teacher. I think Steiner is the same. Um, and uh, I think Blavatsky is the same. Um, so that's where we are, I think, in, in, the ter in terms of what Debushish and I are talking about and writing about. I hope I haven't distorted what we've been doing, but um, I did want to work in Bergson, which leads, us, leads me at least to say spiritual and religious, but not limited to any religion or even religions uh, collectively, because it's the universal spiritual that's the primary commitment. Debushish, what do you think of that? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I think uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think uh, really, as you said, uh, a different kind of, uh, you know, I think the, the beauty of Sri Aurobindo's teaching, um, he writes somewhere in the synthesis of yoga that there will be uh, the true realization of the integral yoga when there are as many forms of integral yoga as there are human beings. And he actually quotes, uh, I mean, in saying this, he's going back to Vivekananda and Vivekananda's idea of universal religion, where he's saying Vivekananda said that there will be true universal religion when there are as many religions as human beings. So, you know, in a way that's, that's where uh, this kind of plurality uh, cannot come about by itself. And it has to have different manifestations in different kinds of societies. So we have a ashram in a certain type of milu time and place. We have an Oroville in another kind of uh, context. And I think similarly, the teaching of Sri Aurobindo has tremendous promise in, in an educational habitus. And that's what uh, uh, Haridas Chaudhary tried to manifest. And I think uh, with, with that, we can stop today and open ourselves to questions because the best we can do is to just uh, give a hint of what all this is about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David Shish. As always, it's wonderful when we get together and um, and collaborate and complement each other's knowledge and aspirations. So, who's in Jonathan? Yes. You in charge? Thank you. Gonna make Absolutely. it happen. Thank you, Robert and David Shish. That was a, a fantastic um, conversation. Um, I think I I would say for me, it's. It's uh, I, it's like Jnana Yoga in action. It's something that's charging me up in a, in a, in a very uh, yogic sense. And um, I appreciate everything that was brought to the table. Um, and we will take questions. Um, if, yeah, uh, oh, Jean-Michel, if somebody had raised their hand, you can raise your hand um, in the reaction area on the bottom of your screen. Um, that would be the best way because we have a couple screens to navigate here as the hosts and we won't be able to see you if you physically raise your hand necessarily. You can also type your message in the chat, um, either um, privately or to everybody. And Stefan and I will, can read that out. And Jonathan? yes. Yeah, I just wanted, there's been a, there was a, a message in the chat that was there just a, for a while. So I just wanted to share that before we get into, uh, sure. get to Jean-Michel. This is from uh, Margaret Fanes. Just, uh, uh, I think, a, a thank you for the talk. She, says it was a tour de force of Sri Aurobindo's thought in all important categories of consciousness and life. Thank you. And I just wanted to concur. Mm -hmm. also. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I concur as well. And um, I was just wondering if I could, uh, usually I save my questions to the end, but I just would love to ask a question off the top today, if that's all right with everybody else. Um, because I, I loved, and Debushish, you brought it out at the very end again, the revolutionary aspect of, of Sri Aurobindo and the, the other thinkers as well that you brought in certain types of revolutions that they were you know, undertaking. Um, and I guess I was trying to think about the condition of evolution as revolution, because there can be many types of evolutionary ideas. And so it seems as though the condition of revolution, it depends on the kind of knowledge production um, and the teleology that might be involved in that kind of a, a knowledge production. So as in the knowledge of knowledge production, let's say as in modernity. Um, and 
so like I'm just thinking out of Stiegler here, so maybe this is more addressed to Debesheesh, but the role of memory in knowledge production, um, the idea that that mnemotechnics or the technologies of memory is really how we can extend into the cultural sphere and you know and, and generate knowledge. But brought up at the end, we're, th we're thinking beyond the categories of religion or even a notion of, of the, the spiritual as something that's absolutely knowable, identifiable. Um, and it's, so I think that's, that's where I get to ask, I want, I'd like to ask the role of Sri Aurobindo's idea of the supermind in, in this relationship to approaching a, a, an alternative idea of memory and how that can play into, let's say, the spiritual anarchism and, and generate types of memories of the one or the radically infinite and how that can actually, um, if we can change our relationship or our technology of memory, how that may change our, the technologies of knowledge production in itself to avoid this kind of teleological closure that we seem to be battling when we're, we might be trying to think revolution, but we caught up we're getting caught up in some kind of a somebody else's version of evolution. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Actually, that uh, your question is very profound and goes to the heart of uh, of the revolutionary aspect of uh, Sri Aurobindo as a modern thinker. You know, and you know the the notion of one may say perpetual revolution, evolution as perpetual revolution. You see, so the the uh, and bringing in the notion of supermind uh, as the condition for uh, a revolutionary uh, state of existence, um, and I think what what it is is we, we go back to the notion of vigyana. We were talking about Ramakrishna. We were talking about that idea of the plural. Uh, plural is really a a the, the central problem of our times, we could call it the central problem of modernity. The central problem of modernity, which is why the postmodern is a continuation of the modern. The central problem of modernity arises because we have a world history today. We have a process of universalization through, ultimately through colonization that has confronted uh, plurality. And the plurality hasn't gone away. The notion was that modernity will become a universal phenomenon. To some extent, it is. We, we see ourselves as ubiquitously modern, not Indian moderns and West African moderns, etc. Uh, there is a kind of ubiquitous modernity. At the same time, there is actual plurality. There is the fact that the something escapes from that attempt to universalize a homogeneous idea of the human. And so the notion of the, the vigyana of, of, uh, of the supermind is, can we arrive at a consciousness which is one and plural equally at the same time, see? And in terms of memory, in terms of mnemotechnics, this is really a reaching beyond our single genealogies. Bergson is making an attempt at that. He's saying that each one of us has an individual memory and we can have an intuition of ourselves as temporal beings, as a flow of becoming. But there is a universal flow of becoming to which we all belong. See, can we get out of the individual to that universal? And at the same time, can we know the individuals as unique individuals? So this is the vanishing point where we can have a consciousness which seeks for the one in the many without losing the many in the one, you see? So that is supermind. That the, the mother has a beautiful quote about the condition of that consciousness as a, a, a consciousness of plurality um, in, a, in a society where each individual feels, experiences the whole. It's not just a mental concept. 
it's not just my understanding your cultural uh, you know tastes or your history right uh, the engagement with history through what you're calling mnemotechnics is is actually the formation of a genealogy we connect with a past which see, Sri Aurobindo, we never got into that, but Sri Aurobindo was creating a genealogy for himself. As Robert said, without being a Hindu, he was engaging with these Hindu texts. And he was engaging with them from a universal vantage, not from a sectarian vantage. So these reclamations through interpretation builds him a genealogy that gives him a certain historical provenance individually. And that takes him into the future. So he's building for himself the roots of a past that give him the conditions to catapult into a future. At the same time, this past that he's building a relationship with being unique, being related to unique gods like Krishna and Kali is also being seen by him in a universal way. That's why in his universal texts, you won't find mentions of Krishna and Kali. He's leaving it to you to experience for yourself. So to think the individual and the universal at the same time, to build individual genealogies through connection with history but also to know that these are in relation with universal genealogies. I think that's the way towards that vanishing point of the supermind that can form a society that is, that is one and many at the same time, that is un united and plural at the same time. I don't know if this, uh, if what I'm saying is coming through it's a it's a very fraught question because we are talking about a future to come yeah but it's at the same time through aspiration that we move towards that and we direct our uh, orientation through our concepts our ideas devishish uh, uh, haridas choudhury uh takes on this extremely challenging topic in, in his essay on supermind in the International Philosophical Quarterly, perhaps in other places too, but in that uh, essay, he, he really tries to explain how his understanding of supermind is the affirmation of individuality and universality without losing either. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's, it's, it should be read by everybody. Uh, and, and that international uh, philosophical quarterly, um, it's out of print, but I think we have it in our uh, in, in the archives, right, Robert? Don't we have that uh, in the CIIS uh, archives? Um, we, we were thinking of republishing it, right, Robert? Was right. that one yeah. of the books? Yeah, I, I don't know what, uh, I mean, um, well, uh, I'm at a loss in the moment, but uh, I mean, I have <laughs> five copies right over there on my bookcase uh, so that I should figure a way. I, I don't know if we can extract it, you know, but somebody we maybe get it scanned. Could, could you look into that? It's uh, Hari Das and Choudhury and uh, Hari Das Choudhury and Robert McDermott editors, International Philosophical Quarterly, 1972. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. We, we will look into it. I, I have a copy here as well. Uh, Jean Michel has been waiting a long time. Yeah. Please, Jean Michel, ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so I have a question uh, that is a bit intuitive. Uh, it came to me right now while listening to you. It is about the, the occult or spiritual forces that, that are acting through history. And uh, I was thinking that um, Russia really now represents the fall of the Marxist uh, utopia. And uh, at the same time, Max Theon was coming from Russia. Blavatsky was coming from Russia. And also a very important figure that, is, that was very uh, uh, post-humanist, post Gurdjieff, 
uh, who was also in Paris at the time, uh, was coming from Russia. And now we are having this, this conflict of Russia really in Ukraine, and Ukraine is really the, the, the heart, the center of the, of the Orthodox Church that, that really preserved uh, the Gnostic tradition in Europe. And uh, so I feel intuitively that, that Russia might have a, a, a role to play in, um, in the East-West uh, uh, integration that, that Aurobindo, Aurobindo was envisaging and that, that, it's, um, that it's connected to it, you know, in, in some way. And this is why uh, it is a place that is now so much uh, disturbed by the Azura. Um, it, it's more a question that I would like your, your feelings or your thoughts on that. Uh, for me, uh, as, I, as I intuitively feel it, it's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Your question sends me to uh, Leibniz, the uh, 18th century German philosopher who uh, in a little book called, uh, what was the name, uh, Seneca, um, ah, Seneca, Seneca, uh, Novissima Seneca, uh, he talks about uh, Russia being the, the uh, middle link between Europe and China. Um, and so there is no doubt uh, extremely important streams in com in, that have survived in, um, in Russia uh, after 70 years of atheistic communism. Uh, and uh, they, there is still a spiritual dimension uh, such that, you know, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Gogol, etc., are somehow alive. Uh, it's a very complicated question because it, um, you can look at it either in terms of uh, the, uh, the violence and the um, sectarian grand grandiosity, which uh, is there, along with this profound uh, commitment to the transformation of suffering. That uh, leads me to think that uh, their, their role, their karmic role in world history is, um, should not be underestimated. I think that's quite a, a good question and a really good topic. I hope you pursue it. Yes, because I mean, we, we, we might be at the verge of a third world war and, and, and at which, which with Russia at the center. So um, this is why I think it's yeah, worth to, to contemplate this. It's, it's, yeah. It's, 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 some of you, was one of you have someone knocking on the door? I got up to look to see if it was my door, but it wasn't. So anyway, whoever has that. Okay. Go ahead, David Shish. No, I, I don't have anything to say, Robert. I, I, I agree with all that y'all are saying. It's it's a very fraught question, and definitely Russia has deep spiritual energy. Uh, but yes, I think Chad Woodward has had his hand up for for some time. Yeah, hello. Um, really enjoyed this talk, and, and yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I was just curious, you know, uh, the reason I first heard about Aurobindo Or is because I was touring India and I saw Orville in a, in a guidebook. And so without that, I would maybe not have heard of him until I encountered CIS, of course. And so I, I feel like whenever I encounter a, a conversation about influential Indian uh, yogis from the 20th century, you always hear about uh, Ramana Maharshi, Maharishi, Mahash Yogi, uh, Ramakrishna, Yogananda, Vivekananda. Um, but you don't hear so much about or Orbindo, or maybe it's just my own, a, a quirk of my own sort of like, spiritual travels. But I'm just wondering, I guess my question is, you know, it seems like maybe he's not as popular as he um, otherwise should should be in a sense, and maybe you're working to correct that. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to me why that would be, you know. Yeah, that's, it's a, it's a complex question. Uh, one could answer it in many ways. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure Robert will have a, a view on it. Uh, my own uh, feeling is that, uh, you know, in his own time, he was very well known. Uh, he was well known in his own time. And, uh, you know, I think he was not very fond or he really didn't want uh, proselytizing of his uh, teachings. Um, he kind of uh, thought that that 
actually destroys the spiritual content. Uh, and so it was always low key to the extent that people heard him or of him and came across his teachings, found it appealing, they turned to him. There isn't that popular edge to his teaching which could make it something like that. And I think he wanted it like that. Of course, today in India, uh, there is a religious dimension that has also emerged. And there are places in India where he's treated like a god, etc. But uh, on the other hand, I think by and large, um, he doesn't lend in himself to large followings of worship, so to say. Uh, Robert, what do you think? No, I could read a passage from uh, Sri Aurobindo. Um, uh, he says, uh, this is 1934, um, Sri Aurobindo wrote, a movement in the case of a work like mine means the founding of a school or a sect or some other damn nonsense. It means that hundreds or thousands of useless people join in and corrupt the work or reduce it to a pompous farce from which the truth which was coming down recedes into secrecy and silence. It is what has happened to the religions and it is the reason of their failure. Pretty strong text, I must say. <laughs> uh, but it was it was clear in 1934. Yeah, very yeah. apt. I, I was thinking about that actually, that it's wonderful that you had that quote in hand. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great topic. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have maybe time for one more question or comment. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, a... do you want to say something? Stefan, yeah, jump in. And Stefan, could you uh, read maybe uh, Alexis's question as well? Why don't you read Alexis's passage or a statement? Sure, sure. And I was actually, I found the, uh, the article, um, the Supermind article from Haridas Chaudhry, and I have a PDF of it. And I thought that I could put the PDF into the chat, but I'm not able to do it. So uh, maybe what I can do is I can put my email uh, my school email into the chat and anybody who's interested in getting a copy of the paper, I'm more than happy to send it to you. Would that be okay? Thanks, Wonderful. Stefan. And, That's awesome. All right. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read uh, Alexis's uh, question and, and I maybe add just a, a, a little something. Um, anyway, thank you. Alexis says, wonderful and exciting dis uh, discussing. I would love to hear more about ways we can explore and expand upon where the conversation was turning towards applications in integral education moving forward. And I hope this conversation continues. Thank you. And I was just thinking, and I hope this, this may be take it, it's too much too tangential to this specific question, but I was wondering of the place in education in, in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, combating the loss of memory, um, a kind of a, a cultural memory that gives us kind of uh, a guideline towards where we may be heading. In our culture today, there seems to be a, a mad rush towards uh, abandoning uh, memory and a replacement of that with arbitrary uh, facts, you know, um, and the danger of that. So I'm, I'm, I, I guess that I was thinking along the same lines about where's the place of integral education in this? And uh, where can somebody turn to find out more about this in a practical way? Stefan, I think your, your question is also related to Jonathan's question. And you know that it's, it's, it can't be overemphasized, this whole issue of memory and uh, of the loss of memory, because loss of memory is really a characteristic of our times. In fact, it's a characteristic of modernity because we are instrumentalized. The whole of modernity is really about making us into technological beings that we uh, are in service of some kind of production, some kind of utility all the time. And that in a way flattens us and makes us into immediate beings concerned with what needs to be done right now, you see. And that's exactly where, when we are talking about, I mean, Jonathan was talk, talking, he used the term memotechnics. In other words, 
at the same time, we have all these memory technologies. We have recordings. Uh, we, are, we are just talking about putting a PDF of Haridas Chaudhary um, on the uh, on the web for everybody to look at. That's a Nevo technology. It's it's basically part of our genealogy as an institution. And it's available to us right now. But the question is right now, how many people are interested in it, right? So we have to build that inner core where we defy, we challenge the uh, pressure of instrumentalization. And that's where, you know, talking about memory, there's another realm of memory which is what, what Sri Aurobindo is calling the psychic, what Mother and Sri Aurobindo call the psychic. The psychic, the soul, is the true center of the depth dimension in us. It's the source of memory because that is what reincarnates. It's the part in us that travels through time. And the closer we get to it, the more we have what truly Bergson was calling the intuition of the temporal because that is the real becoming in us. So to the extent there are both, I mean, talking about the, the technological as a source of memory and talking about the intuitional as a source of memory, uh, the two have to coexist and connect with each other. And the first step is to turn within. That's the whole thing where Sri Aurobindo is challenging the instrumentalization of our time. Good, good wrap up, Devashish. Wonderful. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, bringing in the psychic being at that moment was absolutely profound for me. Um, I think that we can, uh, we've had an extremely uh, potent and deep, <laughs> both <laughs> horizontal and vertical. <laughs> conversation um if if uh, robert uh, you and debish is your okay shall we close here if there's no more questions um from from sure. anybody else no nope. and stefan's offered to um send the paper to anybody that's interested i've also posted um haridas chaudhry archive which he has there's tons many hours of lectures for those interested and i've posted a, a link to a talk that that Robert and Debashish gave, uh, what, a month ago, even, maybe not even, that, on spirituality and integral education. Um, that was for public programs, which was also a fantastic talk, which gets more into uh, education and pedagogy. But shall we okay. close here? Good. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you.